This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. This is the BBC. Hello. I know that you're expecting the Comedy of the Week podcast, and that's just about to play. My name's Josie Long, and I present Shortcuts, which is also made by the BBC and available as a podcast. We would love it if you gave us a try. Short documentaries for radio on a theme. It's like a longer documentary, but better, more time efficient. If that sounds like something you're interested in, please subscribe to Shortcuts, however you normally get your podcasts, and give the show a go. Hi, I'm Sindhu V, and this is the Comedy of the Week podcast, The Home of incredible comedy from BBC Radio 4. Ladies and gentlemen, get comfortable. We're about to begin. Hello, my name's Rufus Hound, and welcome to My Teenage Diary, the show where I invite brave adults to look back at their teenage past by reopening their diaries and reading them out in public for the very first time. My guest tonight is the writer, creator and performer behind some of Radio 4's best-loved comedy programmes, Cabin Pressure and The Souvenir Programme. That's what he's like now, but we're about to find out what he was like way back then. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Finnamore! <laughs> Well, John, you're at a Radio 4 comedy recording. This is Home Turf. Yes, absolutely, yeah. It, With a book I wrote when I was 19, this is not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm given to understand you had some nervousness about this. Yeah, I loved the show and never wanted to be on it. <laughs> uh, I had very few categories that that falls. It's Strictly Come Dancing and this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, now you've crossed this one off. <laughs> So, which diary will you be reading from today? I will be reading from the diary at the time I spent teaching English in Poland between school and university uh, in 1997 when I was 19, so just squeaking in underneath your titular age barrier. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've left school, you're on your gap year. Is there anything else we should know about your life in 1997? No, not much. I'm living at home in uh, Dorset where I grew up. I've got my A-levels. I've Got university place, it's my gap year, it's got to Christmas, I'm still in Dorset. Uh, I start to panic, I'm wasting my life. I very, very briefly research teaching English in Eastern Europe, and then I go to Poland. <laughs> I don't speak Polish, I don't know anyone in Poland, and I have no plan. So, <laughs> it's 1997. Princess Diana is killed in a tragic car accident in Paris. Tony Blair leads the Labour Party to power at last. And in New York, the IBM computer Deep Blue defeated world chess champion Gary Kasparov. Programmed to think and respond like a human being, Tony Blair remained in power for a long time. <laughs> but what is the 19-year-old John Finnamore doing? Saturday, 25th of January, 1997. Well, here goes... To be honest with myself, going to Poland to teach English has basically been an umbrella to shelter myself from unwelcome questions. <laughs> Not that I didn't think I would do it. I did. But I rather expected Poland to turn up on my doorstep. Nonetheless, here I am, in a 757, coming into land at Warsaw in ten minutes. I'm not on the plane anymore, I'm on the night train from Warsaw to Krakow <laughs> and feeling slightly astonished by own adequacy. <laughs> My usual style is to dither and prevaricate until it's too late, then make a decision and run round very fast trying to catch up. Not this time, though. I managed to decide whether or not to stay a night in Warsaw. Not. <laughs> I asked a Polish couple to tell me if the train ran on Saturday, got to the station, bought my ticket, found the platform at the second attempt, and actually caught the train. It's a pity, really, that this mundane list of basic procedures actually represents a triumph for me. <laughs> But sadly, it does. <laughs> so, <laughs> you say it's a shame that this represents triumph, but I think it is a triumph. Yeah, I think that's something I've uh, discovered rereading this diary, is this odd mixture between um, clearly much less confident than I remember, being absolutely uh, sure that I was terrible and I was going to fail at every moment, and yet blithely doing really hard things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, th this catching the train is quite hard, but... 
I've got nothing to do when I get there. I've got nowhere to stay. I've got no job lined up. I don't have a TEFL certificate. What the hell am I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, why Poland? I think basically on a line between places that felt like they were you know, exciting and, and different, you know, you couldn't go spend your gap year in, it'd be lovely to spend a gap year in France, but it's not what gap years are for. And on the other hand, you know, a gap year in North Korea, possibly a bit too, <laughs> too taxing, even for me. So, yeah, it was kind of on the... No, and also where I thought I could get a job. I didn't have a TEFL certificate. I researched it and found I couldn't get one. I was too young to get one. So I basically had to go somewhere where they were so desperate for English teachers that I could make a living without any qualifications. <laughs> a good halfway house between the south of France and North Korea. <laughs> I believe that's the national slogan. <laughs> I'm sorry, Poland, I know it isn't. You're a lucky guy. So the young John Finnemore is now in the historical Polish city of Krakow. Let's see what happens the next day. Sunday, the 26th of January. Well, I've done pretty well today. I fixed up accommodation at the youth hostel, 14 zloty, £3.50 for two nights. I've also found the English department at the university. Of course, it being a Sunday, no one was about. <laughs> but I got some addresses from the board and I know where it is for tomorrow. Then I went on a long, reasonably aimless walk around Krakow, jotting down numbers for English schools and bookshops when I saw them. I'm now sitting in a cafe, trying to make a microscopic dot of ice cream last as long as possible <laughs> while I sit in the warm. My mood <laughs> is precarious. <laughs> Bless him. Uh, my mood is precarious. Having not had a chance to meet anyone in connection with getting a job, I still don't know how difficult it's going to be. I have occasional moments of, what am I doing here? <laughs> and why Poland, for God's sake? But they pass. I also have moments of optimism which also pass. <laughs> the weather, at least, is good. Quite sunny with thick snow. <laughs> there were some beautiful views of the bare, snow-covered trees against the sky today. On the other hand, there was also a frozen rat in the gutter. <laughs> Have still not made any acquaintances. <laughs> Except a Taiwanese student who is now in Vienna. <laughs> this is largely because I remain too shy to strike up conversations. Aww. Also, of course, this is my first full day in the city and I don't speak the language. <laughs> I mean, bemoaning that you haven't built up a full I'm... social circle in, in the last 18 hours. So you're wandering around Krakow, furtively jotting down numbers and hanging around a cafe for a suspiciously long time with a microscopic <laughs> dot. It sounds just like a Cold War spy film. <laughs> oh, oh, you have no idea how unlike James Bond I was at my <laughs> time. So had you led quite a sheltered life, would you say, up until this point? Yeah, yeah, um, you know, provincial grammar school life, yeah, in Dorset, quite a good boy, you know, I wasn't a tearaway. Yeah, I mean, that'll amaze you, <laughs> looking at me now, but uh, for a while I was really quite establishment. <laughs> <laughs> then I broke away to my career in Radio 4. <laughs> so we'll continue. Monday, 27th of January. Spent a merry day walking around Krakow in a suit, being told to go away. <laughs> I ended up at the International School of Krakow in a meeting with the new director. He was the first of many people who turned me down for lack of a TEFL certificate, teaching English as a foreign language. However, he was very enthusiastic and said I could use the school's number as a contact number. So, I have now placed an advert in the local paper, running for five nights, reading, English with an Englishman. <laughs> in Polish, and the international school number. Plus, a nice student called Brigida has promised to come with me to the government bureau that places native speakers in schools tomorrow in case I need a translator. Tuesday, 28th of January. I have a job. <laughs> it turned out Brigida needed to come with me as the woman at the bureau spoke fluent English. However, the fluent woman used her fluent English to fluently tell me to piss off. <laughs> 
Without a teaching certificate, she said there'll be no work permit and therefore no work in the public sector. She then gave me some private school addresses, plus the address of a firm of detectives for no discernible reason. <laughs> and went on her fluent way. <laughs> Whereupon Brigida said that was funny because that's not how she remembered it at her old school. So, we went to her old school and met her old teachers, with me receiving a running commentary on them in English from Brigida, often while they were still in the room. <laughs> he will meet now our headmaster. He is very, very stupid. <laughs> this is the vice head. She is cute. <laughs> anyway, Brigida spoke to the nice vice. The nice vice spoke to the language teacher. They both spoke to the head. The head picked up the phone and spoke to someone in Russia, possibly Boris Yeltsin. <laughs> Eventually, Brigida turned around and said, so you're employed. <laughs> and so I was. I mean, this is the immigration story we don't really hear about. English people with no qualifications, <laughs> going over to Poland, stealing their jobs. Exactly. I mean, they've given us thousands of brilliant builders and plumbers. <laughs> we gave them John Finnamore. <laughs> so how does your first day on the new job go? Wednesday, 29th of January. Today was in at the deep end day. I got to school in plenty of time, but Karen, the outgoing native speaker I am supposed to be shadowing, overslept. So the head of languages naturally sent me up to cover for her. <laughs> no register, no lesson plan, no text. All these are unnecessary hindrances for a young teacher. Well, it went all right <laughs> once I got into the swing of it, but I was far too diffident with them. When I start properly, I must learn to act full of confidence, however nervous I am. Karen is frequently terrifying about the students. Some, she says, are lovely, but others will beat you up mentally and take every advantage of you they can. <laughs> she also said at one point, it's like having lots of mice in your flat, and at another, it's like small animals tearing flesh off you. <laughs> This isn't fair on her taking those quotes on their own, but she is often pessimistic. It sounds like Karen's taught a few too many terms. <laughs> yeah. So Karen had been teaching there and she was on the way out and you were going to replace her. Yeah, and uh, she'd resigned that week. So I just arrived at the best possible time when they'd suddenly lost a, a native speaker. And just as the lady at the bureau correctly told me, they couldn't employ me without a work permit, so they didn't employ me. I just picked up all of Karen's paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> I carried on as Karen for the next six months. <laughs> Is teaching anything like doing comedy? You talk about having to act. Was it good training for your later career? Yes, it's so much like, as I later discovered, like comedy. It's all about just projecting confidence and making it look like you want to be there and so they don't have to worry. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, in the, in the cases of audiences, they can relax. And, it's all right, if that joke didn't work, there'll be another one along in a minute, in case, <laughs> in case of students, so they don't scent blood and tear you limb from limb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's have some more diary. Friday the 31st of January, 1997. Karen's last day at the school. Took 3D alone, the oldest class in the school. I don't think Karen bothered with lesson plans this week. 3D were not fun. They are my age, or a year younger, and there was a ripple around the class when I said I was 20. <laughs> I'm not, of course. I think my best plan for survival is to have very rigid, well-worked-out lesson plans. At least to start with. I also need to act older. I wonder if I dare grow a beard. <laughs> So let's get this straight. You were a supposedly older man trying to carry the affections and teach a group of young, conflicted adolescents. You don't need to grow a beard to impress them. You needed to buy a motorcycle and learn how to make the jukebox play for free by punching it. upon your vex, in the D. Fjordek, Shrodesh, die sleeve in the D. Stratek, Pjontek, die sleeve in the D. Sobota, Sosagene, ready to learn from you. I suppose what I'm asking, John, is... <laughs> were these happy days? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear a bit more from your diary, John Finnamore. Saturday, 1st of February. Back to school to see if I could pick my wages up. No. 
<laughs> Whilst there, I phoned the family whose number I was given as potential landlords. I asked when I could come and visit them, and they said that if I wanted, I could move in that evening. <laughs> Spent an hour and a half running around town trying to buy flowers to bring. Memorable moment was asking in a chemist where I could get flowers and being presented with cotton wool. <laughs> Anyway, family seemed nice. They even gave me dinner. Not sure if meals are to be a regular thing or just a treat for the new arrival. Also, there doesn't seem to be a bathroom I can use. <laughs> Sunday, 2nd of February. Tomek, my new landlord, kindly offered to take me into town today in order, he said, to explain it. <laughs> Tomek is a great explainer, by which I mean that he explains a great deal. He explains that this, where we are standing on, is bridge and goes over river. <laughs> he explains that this is green place in town and here are trees. <laughs> I appreciate that he is a kind man giving up his time to make me feel at home. But oh my God, he's boring. <laughs> the only bearable bits were when he started telling me legends or historical stories. His English isn't up to this, which makes them much more interesting. <laughs> My favourite was the one about when, plenty, plenty years ago, the Tatra Mountains invaded Krakow. <laughs> Apparently, the nuns of the city, and there were plenty, plenty of these nuns, responded to this by walking from a church on one side of the road to a church on the other. <laughs> then, 500 years later, they built a small hill. Clearly, these nuns believed in biding their time. <laughs> so, in between failing to teach their children English, you're ridiculing the Polish and their heartfelt attempts at hospitality. <laughs> I mean, that, this, this is me trying to be funny. This is me having a go at writing comedy, which is the thing I, you know, I, I loved as a teenager and was beginning to wonder if I could have a crack at it. Reading it now, I realise that's me trying to do a bit. Yeah. Uh, for myself, you know, I had no expectation. I certainly wouldn't have shown this diary to anyone. This is just me having a go. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're obviously very funny. I mean, we know that now, obviously. <laughs> but uh, even back then, I mean, were you told, yes, you should pursue this. This is absolutely, you should be doing comedy. I'd been very shy, and then I started to make people laugh. And I was not the class clown, but I could make people laugh socially. And that changed my life, you know, that made, that, that got me friends, and it got me girlfriends, and not, like, just a girlfriend at all, that's all I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, there was that, but there was also just that I loved comedy, I discovered comedy the way that normal teenagers discover music, in exactly the same way, and I was buying and listening to stuff, and listening to things, you know, sprouting from that stuff, in mm. exactly the, the same way that all of my friends were listening and discovering bands. I never really cared much about bands, but, my God, I loved comedy. Yeah, so now let's continue. Friday, 7th of February. In the last week, via Rachel at the British Council Library, I have stumbled across a secret ring of expat Brits. <laughs> Most of whom are teaching at a large factory nearby. They are all postgrad, about 25, and greeted news of my tender years with howls of disbelief. <laughs> no doubt this will scratch any chances I might have had with the more short-sighted female members of the group. <laughs> Although even more effective in this regard, I suspect, is my utterly revolting wispy moustache <laughs> and peculiar beard, which is enthusiastically colonising my neck and jowls while leaving my chin religiously alone. <laughs> Friday 14th of February. One card. <laughs> From Library Rachel. I think I am right in thinking this to be a joke. <laughs> Mind you, joke card, invitation to cinema, invitation to stay night, might there be interest? <laughs> no. <laughs> Wishful thinking. <laughs> Saturday 15th of February. Water apparently turned off at youth hostel that still serves as my bathroom. <laughs> Mine must be the only ensuite shower separated from bedroom by two trams and a bus ride. So you can't get a girlfriend and it's two trams and a bus ride to a wash. Do you think these <laughs> two things maybe 
I think I can't get a girlfriend, but a girl has invited me to the cinema, invited me to stay over in a nice old you want to kip over sort of way, but still, and then sent me a Valentine's Day card, and I think it's a joke. <laughs> I just, I mean, I might be wrong, but now I don't think that was a joke. Yeah. Is there a part of you that wants to reach back through time? Rachel, yourself? if you can hear me. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> uh, you'd been to a grammar school. Was that an all-boys school? Do you know what it was? <laughs> <laughs> I was a state school, but it was still somehow single-ed, and, oh, I wish it wasn't. I wish it hadn't been. I, I think, yeah. So, what an odd way to, to raise a child. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll continue, and you're off on your first school trip. Mm. Sunday, 16th of February. I am on a coach, heading off into the mountains for a week of English camp with 2B. Feel like a complete imposter sitting up at the front with my fellow members of staff, as I cannot get used to thinking of them. <laughs> Laid-back English teacher and aftershave enthusiast Bartosh. <laughs> Two B's form teacher who speaks no English, and Katagina and Anya, two students of English from the university here to gain teaching experience. At any rate, at least I'm not the only imposter. <laughs> Tuesday, 18th of February. Aftershave Bartosh and I will never be friends. <laughs> He's out to impress everyone. The pupils, Katagina and Anya, and for some reason it seems particularly me. Maybe because I'm English. He also keeps trying to tell me which poems to teach, which is supposed to be up to me. <laughs> but 2B turn out to be great. And so are Katagina and Anya. <laughs> Were you starting to learn Polish by now? Enough to get by in shops and on trams, because you had to. But yeah, I could, I could stumble along. The uh, line of Polish that took me longest to learn was the first line of my address with that family. Uh, which was uh, Jaden, so far so good, straightforward, ten. Ulitsa, that's fine, that's street. Shishishko bohushka shek shawe. Which I think has more Zs in it than vowels. <laughs> I bet you were an absolute demon at Countdown. <laughs> in Poland. <laughs> Friday, 21st of February, last day of English camp. This morning I received a postcard. Not through the post, but by hand, and not from anywhere exotic. The picture is of a place called Gorce, which is presumably near here. I know it's presumably near here because I bought this postcard myself. <laughs> Yesterday, when I said I was going to walk out to the distant post office to buy some stamps, Katagina, who has so far appeared in these chronicles only as one half of Katagina and Anya, asked me to buy her some postcards. I did. This morning, as I left for Krakow, she thrust one of them back at me, folded and with a short poem on it. Ooh. Asking Providence not to let coincidence blow away like smoke. <laughs> what do you make of that then, sunshine? <laughs> this is utterly unexpected. Katagina and Anya, always together, never separately, and I only talk together at meals when Bartosz shares our table, and then, politely and impersonally, when I went round to their room for an hour or so some evenings. <laughs> I am now combing my memory for signs of interest, for the feeling is growing that I've got the whole thing out of proportion, and the postcard <laughs> is merely a token of friendship. <laughs> or, I don't know. But the poem... Yes, perhaps all it means is, oi, what's name? Give us a ring sometime. And in thinking more of it, I'm suffering my habitual delusions of grandeur. <laughs> yes, but no. No, you do not write blank verse odes to Providence when you want someone to give you a ring sometime. What you do when you want someone to give you a ring sometime is you go up to someone and you say, give us a ring sometime. <laughs> And indeed, this is what they both did. And that was before Katagina came running back into the hotel to thrust poetic cardboard at me. <laughs> but I've no idea what to do about it. <laughs> Saturday, 22nd of February. Well, what to do about it, apparently, was to phone her up about nine this evening, ask after her exam, postponed, tell her about the end of camp, and then once I got round to mentioning it, to wax appropriately lyrical about the poem and arrange to meet her by the stone lion at the clock tower in Rynek Kowofny at 7.30 on Monday. Ooh. 
I ask you, do rendezvous come any more romantic than that? <laughs> So, what happened with you and Kat? Was it the start of something beautiful? Well, this is the next entry. The last one was 22nd of February. Thursday, the 1st of May. <laughs> what happened to March? Also April. I don't know why I always stop writing my diary as soon as I get a girlfriend. <laughs> So your lover, Katarzyna, wrote you a blank verse ode. Do you have that poem with you? I do, I, I, but I, I don't feel like it's mine to read out. It's not her teenage diary. I mean, if any of my teenage poetry got... If this was called my teenage poetry, you wouldn't see me for dust. <laughs> <laughs> but in the back of your diary, we found the draft of a poem. Uh, <laughs> that, that you wrote to her in reply... Uh, I think it's an undiscovered masterpiece, so uh, with your permission, I'm going to read it out now. <laughs> I'm John, an impulsive young chap who thought Poland's the place for my gap. With no clear intent to Krakow I went and never consulted a map. At first my emotions were flat, but the city soon helped me with that. I tried tiny ice cream, joined a language school's team and encountered a frozen dead rat. <laughs> But my school job quite quickly turned weird. You're too young, my pupils all jeered. I found being bolder didn't help me look older, so resorted to growing a beard. <laughs> then a romance which made my heart fly. I got cards, though I don't know why. <laughs> On the sweet Katarzyna, I grew keener and keener, and she loved hanging out with a spy! <laughs> That was excellent, but the moment when you said, well, you say you don't want us to read your poetry out, but we've found my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and in that, like, second before it became clear what you were doing, I was just racing to think, well, clearly I'm not going to let them, you know, put it out, but these people are all going to hear it. <laughs> I can't stop that without looking like a massive bell, and what am I... Oh, my God! <laughs> So, I, yeah, I didn't hear the first half because the blood was still pounding in my ears. <laughs> uh, now that you've read the uh, diary, what do you think you would say to the younger you? Sometimes girls like you. <laughs> and what do you think the younger you would say back? What's Michael Palin like? <laughs> We always ask our guests to choose a song which sums up their teenage years. So what have you chosen and why? Well, I went with eight cassette tapes to Krakow. And as I've said, I wasn't really into bands. They were all comedy. So the music I listened to was mainly classical and it, because I found a Polish radio station. And if you are going to listen to a classical music station in Poland, you had better like Chopin. <laughs> Uh, and luckily I do like him and so this is his Polonaise in A flat major because it is a Polonaise by a pole so it's Poland squared <laughs> wasn't meant to be a joke <laughs> <laughs> so as we enjoy Chopin's Polonaise please thank John Finnamore <laughs> My Teenage Diary is a talkback production for BBC Radio 4. It was presented by me, Rufus Hound, and starred guest John Finnamore. The producer was Harriet Jane. And that's a wrap for this week's Comedy of the Week. Don't forget to tell everyone you know about how much you love these fantabulous comedies from BBC Radio 4. And click subscribe. So you never, ever, 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 ever miss one. And then join me, Sinduvi, next time. It was twilight, and Bailey was late. An extraordinary real-life story. The black woman in the South who raises sons, grandsons, and nephews has her heartstrings tied to a hanging noose. The author Maya Angelou's memoirs on BBC Radio 4 across the coming year. I will be a conductorette. 
I will. Well, nothing beats a trial but a failure. Give it everything you got. Beginning with Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Search for the amazing Maya Angelou wherever you get your podcasts.